Good evening, everyone. I am so happy to be here this evening. Let us join together in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, O oh God, be acceptable in thy sight. Amen. I'm so grateful to be here with this community this evening. I have to say I've never been more nervous and overwhelmed by a preaching invitation than I am with this one. Because as long as I have been able to stand and speak, the Disciples of Christ community has been my home. So it feels like I'm preaching to thousands of family members. Can you imagine how that would feel? I'm really grateful that you all came here tonight. I'm grateful for everyone who is working behind the scenes to make things happen. I want to give a special shout out to Reverend Morales, who preached two nights ago, and Reverend Law, who's going to preach tomorrow night. Both of them are far better preachers than I will ever dream of being. It's such an honor to be up here in their company. And I also want to say that I would gladly turn over the stage to the Reverend Dr. William Barber. <laughs> But I, but I do want to ask, if you haven't heard him preach yet, then you've been in all the wrong places. His new Poor People's Campaign is a fire burning across this country, and I encourage you to take the chance to hear him speak. Wow, to be here last night when we elected our new general minister, the Reverend Teresa Ford Owens, what an amazing thing. As soon as the vote was announced, I texted everyone at Union Theological Seminary in our community to tell them what had just happened, that it was historic. And I swear if I had been in New York, you could have heard shouts ringing across the city. I also want to say a special word of thanks to the Reverend Sharon Watkins. for her invitation to me to preach tonight and for her incredible historic 12 years of service as general minister. I have this like vision that it makes me chuckle when I think about it. You know, uh, the first week that President Obama and Michelle were out of office, you saw them water skiing in Hawaii. I have this vision of Sharon and Rick water skiing in Hawaii. <laughs> Oh, can you imagine having a sister as amazing as the Reverend Verity Jones and a niece? Yeah. And a niece as poised and smart as Gracie. I love them both so much, and I'm proud to no end of the tireless and yet always brilliant and nurturing support that Verity has given to the vocation of ministry and to theological education in the Disciples of Christ. And a shout out for Gracie. She is part of a, a group called Youth on Race, which consists of four congregations uh, that are racially diverse in Indianapolis that have been meeting together to have difficult conversations about race and they are going to have an after session on Tuesday, so I encourage you all to go. I have another sister, too, named Kendi. She's in Oklahoma watching along with my father, the Reverend Dr. Joe Jones. Many of you know him from his years of scholarship and teaching and his disciples' systematic theology, if you can believe that such a thing exists. It's called A Grammar of Faith, and he was going to introduce me this evening, but instead he's watching me because his health prevents him from being here, and he sends his love to you all. As you might have guessed from my thank yous, the household I grew up in was staunchly, if you can use the word staunchly to describe disciples, a staunchly disciples household. 
This community raised me and it resides like the calcium in my bones and the skin that wraps around me. And so I want to begin today by telling a theological story that I think of as disciples theology and it's the ground that I stand on up here preaching to you this evening. And it grounds everything I have to say about social justice. First, I deeply know that our God, the creator of all that is, is a God of love, is a God who freely chooses to pour all of that love into the whole world equally and in full measure to all of God's children and to our earth. That's the first thing. I believe that through the love of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ, we know that we are all saved, universally, already, it's done. <laughs> to be saved means to be the beloved of God, and it's as true for all Christians as it is for Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, Hindus, indigenous faith communities, and for all those who claim no faith, all of us held in love. Third, this love forms the basis of who we are, all of us, in reality. Not just in some alternative universe beyond time or after our deaths. It tells us who we are now. We are all profoundly and intimately interconnected. You with me, me with you, you and me together with our precious earth. In this deep bedrock sense, we are all one, breathing, birthing, living, dying, messy, pulsing, changing, complex, and many-faced, an integrated existence. And that is true whether or not we choose to acknowledge it. It just is. This is what we look like to God. We are distinct, but we're all mushed up together and mixed in with the dust of the earth, the blood that flows through our veins and the air that fills our lungs, all of it binds us together as one being. Fourth, I also believe, as a good disciple's child, that the church is a place where we hear the word and we share communion to help us wake up to this reality of God's love and our interconnectedness the reality of divine love being. The troubles of the world, as we've been talking about all day, cloud our eyes over, they fog up our hearts. We call this clouding, this fogging, we call this sin, and we need time and again to have our eyes wiped clean, our hearts open so we can feel what binds us. That's what the church does. And that's what's being together here tonight is all about. It's about waking up. It's about what happens when we are open and aware of the reality of love, God's love. And fifthly, we cannot help if we know this, but spontaneously and also over time devote ourselves to living in a way that reflects this loving interconnected reality. You don't have a choice about how you live once you're really awakened and behold this glory. So there you have it. My rather old fashioned disciples theology story in a nutshell. We are God created, Jesus grounded, grace bounded, love founded, church grounded. We proclaim the universal reach of God's love and mercy and we affirm that we are interwoven in the depths of the earth, bound together and inspirited with the breath of God's life. And despite the harsh truth that we turn away from it and sin and seek our own destruction, the spirit moves back through us and calls us to seek life abundant. That's it. Thank you all. It's been nice talking to you this evening. So. <laughs> so the topic I was given to focus on my, in my sermon this evening was social justice, building on John 17 and from the words of the hymn that reminds us we are called to save each one's dignity 
and guard each one's pride. Well, the first thing I need to say is this. I think it must be part of my discipleness, but I'm always perplexed by churches and people who makes the distinction between faith and social justice, as if faith were simply a belief system and social justice was simply one of the many things this faith leads you to do. We all know preachers who at least once a month give their social justice sermon and the three other weeks they do something else. I'm sad to say that this past year, I've even heard Christians in liberal white churches say that the church should be in this time and place, a space where we don't talk about social justice at all, because that gets us into politics that divide people. Instead, I have heard said directly, the church should be, quote, a safe space where no one brings up racism or homophobia or mass incarceration and mass deportation or perhaps most importantly the greedy hateful political environment we live in right now this view of preaching and the church to be frank astounds me when i turn to the gospels i don't see jesus talking about a void how we should treat each other and live together. Rather, I see a Jesus always, always advocating for the most vulnerable. So I wonder what Bible are they reading? You can't open this book and fail to see its intense focus on caring for the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the stranger, the poor. And love and social justice in the gospel, simply put, social justice is nothing more than God's love with legs on it. And love and social justice don't mean just the big issues. It affects and touches every part of how we personally live every day. Now, all this is not to say that the task of engaging in gospel-grounded social justice love talk is easy particularly in our present political climate. In fact, in my lifetime, this task has never been harder. And for this reason, having these theological, political, personal conversations in church has never been more crucial. Because I believe that we are in the midst of a political, spiritual love crisis a profound depth. We have a president who happily and without guile disparages every group of people that Jesus loved. He denigrates women. He singles out Muslims and LGBTQ plus people for discriminatory legislation. He promises to deport millions of families and builds wall to keep people out. And in all of this, he celebrates wealth and greed while assuming poverty is a problem the poor have created for themselves. He lives in an entirely different story than the gospel story. The story he tweets about himself as reality is one in which hatred rules and thirst for power defines what it means to be good. It is morally vacuous and in that vacuity it fuels the fires of evil. Now I just I don't want to just focus on President Trump either, although I, I had to say those things. What troubles me even more is that millions, indeed millions of people voted for him and continue to applaud him. And the vast majority of his supporters are church-going, Bible-reading, white, educated Christian men and women who claim to hold the same gospel story at the center of their lives. They are my relatives, my high school friends, our co-workers, our own families, 
and somewhere inside of us all, even part of ourselves. So who are these folks? The white Christian people of this United States of America who chose this path and why? The weight of these questions cannot be overstated for the future of our land and I believe Christianity itself in America depends on how we answer this. For many folks gathered here today, the hatreds that I've just gestured towards are not new. They are far too well known. They have lived in this violence in our country since the beginning of this land. Native Americans, African Americans, the Latinx community, Muslims, LGBTQ brothers and sisters, immigrants of all shapes and sizes, and women who struggle with all they have just to carve out a space for true equality. But what this past presidential election has done is to rip off the bandage that covered over so much of that. And in ripping off the bandage has revealed the depth of white supremacist patriarchal culture as it lives in our country today. What we are now seeing is the depth of the historic wounds that have comprised us, its ragged edges, its festering infection. And though it's been covered up, brothers and sisters, it continues to make the whole body sick. If you believe we're one being, then that festering wound cannot help but destroy us all. Yes, hear the echoes of Jesus and Paul in these words. In the language of our tradition, let us call this wound and the instruments of its infliction sin, sin. And be assured we cannot be healthy of us, any of us, until the sickness that plagues us is cured. So today I want to talk about just three parts of this wound that have had the bandage ripped off, and there are many more parts. But first I want to talk about white patriarchal supremacy, that thing that gouged out the form of our nation and that continues to burrow deeper and deeper into our souls and our policies. Whiteness is an important term here. I'm not simply talking about the color of one's skin, but rather a whole array of privileges that were bestowed upon European Americans that was created way back when our nation took place, took, took shape, and yet continues into this present. James Baldwin, St. James Baldwin, says it best when he says this. He says, the Swedes and Norwegians did not arrive on this soil white. They became white by burning Native American villages, raping women, and ravaging the land they took, and by enslaving as subhuman creatures Africans whose blood and sweat they extracted to build wealth for themselves. This is how whiteness came to be. What James Baldwin is trying to get us to see here is that the whiteness that elected Donald Trump is an American creation with a very long history. White people had to learn through excoriating force how to hate brown people, how to torture them, how to blot them out of their minds, how to not see their humanity. Slavery was the most brutal and sustained system of torture and controlled violence any society has ever known. It was church-supported, state-sanctioned, and it lasted almost 300 years. 300 years! 
And it was followed by another 150 years of Jim Crow laws that continued its hate. And it set up social structures along the way that swept every group that wasn't white and male into the cauldron of its fury. In this system, from the start, the possibility of oneness, of John's unity, of Jesus' love, was utterly inconceivable. 450 years. 450 years it's had that long to insinuate its systemic view and actions into our bones and even most importantly into our unconscious mind. It lives in us all even if we believe it doesn't. And tonight I'm here to say it stops us from knowing the truth of our oneness. Second, caught up in this fury of domination was a second sin that sadly the vast majority of us failed to see for far too long. Along with the idea of expendable bodies came the idea that land and earth and rivers and lakes and mountains and hills and prairies, that they all existed just to be bought and sold and used up until there wasn't anything left to use. All in the name of making money. We treated the earth as if its gifts were infinite. We reaped where we did not sow, and we sacrificed the bounties of God's call for us to care upon the altar of our greed from the beginning of this nation. Just as our national wound is sinning in the sin of racism, it is also manifest in clear-cut forest, in the gaping holes left by mountaintop removals, and in the waterways defiled by oil. The earth it aches and groans and protests its exploitation with ever larger earthquakes hurricanes, tsunamis, tornadoes, floods, droughts. And now scientists tell us if we do not repent, the earth may never recover. And thirdly, into this cauldron of hatred, there was released a third monster of sin, an obsession with making money at any cost. And we see it so painfully today in the consumer culture that dominates the airways and the internet, we are bombarded with ads promising that happiness can be found, not in who we are or how we love each other, but in the things that we buy and how they define the surface of our shallow identities. The truth is our president was elected in large part because he was a rich man, not a good or noble or loving man. Truth be told, wealth is our major national idol. Instead of pointing to, to justice and care, our moral compass too often aligns to the almighty dollar. In 1965, only 30% of college graduates said their top goal was to be very well off financially when they graduated. By the year 2000, that number had grown to 75%, and it continues to rise and is creating a moral crisis of unfathomable proportions. Because this kind of obsessive materialism leaves folks spiritually empty. And you know and I know the consequences of spiritual poverty are dire. Every day, more and more people turn to alcohol and drugs to numb the moral emptiness of being so alone. We are in the grips of an opioid epidemic that continues to grow unabated and this is not a coincidence, especially in small towns and in rural America and on high school gyms and across our college campuses. When people evaluate their self-worth through the lens of their paycheck, they're left completely defenseless 
against life's struggles. And drugs and alcohol are an easy but a deadly escape. I have to say, this cuts close to home for me. In the last two weeks, my 21-year-old daughter lost two of her very close college friends, one from a small town in Vermont and another a small town in Connecticut, both of them to overdoses from Xanax left with fentanyl taken with alcohol. Her one friend, Tucker, his mother found him on the kitchen floor in the morning when she got up, dead. It's the compounded vacuity of our whole culture that undergirds this. So I've told a very long and harsh story about our nation. And there's not a person in this room that doesn't recognize its truth are these very painful and deeply personal horrors. So where's the good news? Now when you get to this part in the sermon, it's very hard not to be Pollyannish, but to still be hopeful. And I do believe that the hope is all around us. We are a people of the gospel. And for us, this is not where it ends. We have a different story to tell. We know that the reality that we are living in is based on a lie about life. And we are called by God to live differently, to seek justice, to follow Jesus, to be one and to believe that we can set a better grace-filled model for how we live together. This is the weird thing, that as disciples, we don't have to work hard to know this. It's already inside us. It's the story we tell. It resides in the marrow of our bones and the rich storehouse of our souls. So, if it's already there, in a sense, what we need to do is take a deep breath and relax into it to fall in to God's love and let it move through us together. Telling you to relax and accept the truth of love after what I've just said seems rather paltry given the principality and powers of our age, doesn't it? But relaxing isn't as easy or weak as it seems. It's not easy because it takes courage to relax into love's alternative reality. It takes conviction, it takes daily practice, it takes being with others, and it requires to constantly interrogate yourself. Do we actually believe the gospel story? Do we actually love our neighbors and ourselves in real time? It also requires this relaxing not just reacting to the crisis, but to stepping back and thinking hard and analyzing carefully, theologically and politically, what's happening around us. Now for the skeptic among us and within us, a little voice like, not likely nags, whispering, three lies that we must cast out. First, the voice tells us that we don't know what to do and that the political system, our social system, our culture is too complex, too complex to fix. That is a lie. We know what we need. Universal health care, healthy, thriving public schools, a guaranteed income so no one falls through the cracks. We need to invest in renewable energy. We need to combat the wages of white supremacy through extensive social services and sustained economic remedies and reparation. We need a new ERA. We need to open our borders and the doors of our prisons and let people walk towards spaces of health and wholeness, not cells. 
and police gunshots. And we need to simply wipe off the books any and all legislation that denigrates anyone, and in particular LGBTQ plus people, that treats them different. This is not ambiguous stuff. This is not unclear and it is not complicated. We could do all of these things tomorrow if we had the will to. There are countries in the world where all of this is already in place and working. We have models and we have proof. We know how to do it. You cannot give in to the despair of thinking it's too complicated. It is not. It's not. The second lie that nags back here is that we're so different from one another that all us people of goodwill can't come together and ultimately agree on anything. Look at the Democratic Party. But this is simply not true as well. Yes, we have much work to do. White supremacy, hatred of the other, treating our earth like an object to be used, and our love of money. But already in many places, like are gathering here, coalitions are actually working smoothly and powerfully through the flow of these tight bonds. There's not nearly as much division on these issues, the ones I listed, amongst a large portion of the population. As we like to believe, it's not as fragmented as it seems, but the principalities and powers want us to believe that working together is impossible. A lie. And then there's the third little voice, and I'll end on this one. It's this fear I think we have inside ourselves that at the end of the day, we actually don't have anything theologically important enough to say that we're kind of outdated, that we're too old-fashioned for the world in its modern form. Well, this is a lie, too. I live in New York City, perhaps the most secular and religiously diverse city in the country, and I can tell you that every day I hear and feel the hunger of people for a deep, morally good story about the meaning of their lives. It's not just a few. Just as one example, for the last five years, one-third of the entering class at Union Theological Seminary has been filled with people who check the box unaffiliated. And why are they coming to seminary? They're coming because they're seeking a better world and they want fulfilling wisdom about the meaning of their lives. But for all of the reasons I've listed, they've given up on church. But they're still coming. Friends, we have a story to tell. We are that story. It is in what we do and how we love and as much as what we say. It is a story we need to tell for so many people. And I think tonight, especially of the young people across our country, like the young people in Flint where water has been poisoned, like the high school students in Newark where 1% of the high school population goes to college for the immigrant 15-year-old in Atlanta who is living in a detention center like a prisoner, for the 18-year-old Sunni kid in Dallas who is mocked at school, for Michael Brown in Ferguson and Tyrone in Jordan and Tamir in Lakeisha, young people killed by police, for the 21-year-old young woman from the Philippines who came here to do domestic labor and is now held as slave labor, for the 24-year-old college student who can't find a job and whose addiction turns him self-destructive. For the 30-year-old veteran addicted to painkillers and haunted by nightmares, having given his life for a country that now throws him away. For the 35-year-old woman with three kids who gets breast cancer and spends her last days finding someone to raise her children because she can't afford treatment. For the 40-year-old truck driver and the 50-year-old waitress who plans on dying before retirement because they have nothing. For all of us, the lost, the afraid, the lonely, those without light, there is a light that shines. Yeah. 
Jesus, Jesus was all these people. He became flesh and took all of this upon him and the world and knocked him down. The principalities and powers did him in and hung him on a cross. And he died like Tucker on the bedroom floor. But the truth is, that could not kill him. He rose. He came back. He came back and he called us to our oneness. He called us to love. He called us to grace. He called us to social justice. He called us to social justice, love. Indeed, he called us to revolutionary love. Brothers and sisters, may it be so. Amen.